Well, I come from Wrexham, not originally, but that's where I live now. I'm a member of one of the Baptist churches in Wrexham. I have been a pastor of two Baptist churches, one in Hadlow and one in Sly. But for the last 25 years of my working life, I worked as director of the Albanian Evangelical Mission, and I retired about five years ago. So there are two books. There's a book called The Great River, which has a subtitle, Primitive Methodism, until 1868. And uh, it's a study of early primitive Methodism, its ethos, its beliefs. Most of the illustrations are taken from my home area, but apart from in County Durham amongst the miners, the movement was the same throughout the country. So the illustrations are from my home area mainly, but the description of the experiences and the ethos and the belief and practices of the movement would apply anywhere. And then there's one published recently by the Wesley Historical Society of Wales called The Primitive Methodist Mission to North Wales, which was largely based or came from Chester and Shropshire. Three lectures. This one I want to make quite personal. I want to tell you how that local revival in my area, how it impacted on my life. The reason I do that, I hope, it's not that I just like to stand up and talk about myself. Probably most of us like to do that, but I hope that's not my motive. The Lord knows. But really, I think what we learn about church history should change our lives. And if it doesn't change our lives, then I think our approach is lacking. The next two will be factual so, those were really preliminary remarks. I called this one, My Life in Early Primitive Methodism. That doesn't mean to say I was born in the 1830s or any time like that, but it's how reading about and uh, thinking about that movement so got into me that uh, really from growing up in a perfectly normal way, my life became redirected under... I believe, the guidance of God. So, I was just say, leading a perfectly normal, ordinary life, born in 1946. I haven't had my birthday yet this year, so you can tell how old I am from that. Born in 1946. In those days, you were born at home. Uh, you weren't born in hospital, I don't think, unless there was something really serious problem uh, with the pregnancy. So, I was born in that house on Christmas Day, and it's in Basingstoke. So that's how I came into this fallen world. And I was sent to Sunday school. George Street Mission. It used to be an independent mission church amongst the railway workers in downtown part of Basingstoke. And then the Wesleyans got hold of it. And they ran it for Sunday services for some years. Mainly by two local preachers, Frank Bath and his brother Arthur Bath. It's closed down now, but that's the building. And uh, that's where I was sent to Sunday school. And I really disliked it. I was quite small. I still am. I was quite well-dressed. I hope you think I still am for such an austere occasion. And I used to get bullied by the other pupils before the Sunday school teachers arrived. And I hated going there. And I don't remember anything at all that I learned. I just remember not liking going. In the end, I negotiated with my father to let me stop going on the understanding that I would attend church with him on a Sunday morning, which I did. So then I went to school. There I am studying for my A-levels. I noticed the typewriter for writing one's essays or one's notes. There were computers in those far-off days. And uh, I enjoyed doing French, German and Latin for a level, Perfectly normal sort of life. Born at home, middle class home, go to Sunday school, go to school, take your O-levels, take your A-levels. And then I got to that point in life where you meet these strange and elusive creatures called girls. And suddenly I discovered the pleasure of their company. Some of them were girlfriends, some of them were just friends. Again in my teens 
the sort of things that anyone would do. I don't think I had much idea what I was going to do with the rest of my life at all. Went to university, got a degree in modern and medieval languages. There's my tutor, Dr. Robson, and I thoroughly enjoyed that. That was 1965 to 68. But shortly before going to university, I read that book on the left. You may even have had a copy. It's quite easy to acquire a copy, even though it's out of print. Lots and lots were done. Joseph Ritson's book called The Romance of Primitive Methodism. I believe in divine providences. Now, my father found that book at a jumble sale, and he thought, oh, David would be interested in this, so we bought it. I think it cost a shilling. It might have been one and six. And for those of you who no longer think in what I like to call real money, that's five pence or five pence or, or um, seven pence halfpenny. So I read that book and I thought, wow, now I'd already become a Christian. I'd, I'd been converted through the work of the Methodist circuit in Basingstoke. But when I read that book, I thought, wow, this is, this is the religion I want. And the one on the right is called uh, The Secret of Mount Cop. Now, Mount Cop, as you probably know, is a hill on the border of Staffordshire and Cheshire where there was a great open-air meeting in 1807 and the Spirit of God <laughs> fell in great power. And that primitive Methodist movement is often regarded as having begun or certainly had a real kick-start at that meeting, camp meetings, they called them, from the old American practice of having wagons in a circle and staying several <laughs> nights. And days, but they didn't do that in, in England. It was just a, a one day thing. So that book, The Secret of Malcott, and I thought, yeah, this is it. Prayer, evangelism, conversions, preaching. That's the religion I want, I thought to myself. About 64, don't know the exact date. And one of the things that Joseph Ritson says in the Romance of Primitive Methodism is some of the most astonishing triumphs were won by the pioneers among the agricultural labourers in the south of England. Now, he could have said in Wiltshire, Hampshire, Berkshire, if he wanted to. It was a really powerful centre. One of the things that uh, Farndale says in The Secret of Mount Cop, by four o'clock in the afternoon, this is talking about the original meeting at Mount Cop, by four o'clock in the afternoon, the number present had grown to thousands. Of these, numbers sense the compelling atmosphere of prayer. And under the appeal of the preached word, acknowledged the need of a saviour and were led into assurance of faith. Now that really encapsulates astonishing triumphs in my home area. Prayer, preaching, assurance of faith. That was what I wanted. And then I started to meet elderly people who had been primitive Methodists. They were probably born in about the 1880s or 1890s. They told me what it had been like in these chapels, probably before the First World War, that sort of time. The one up on the top left is Charter Alley. Charter Alley is a village, it's not a road. You see it with uh, different names in the old um, preaching plan. Sunday it's called Chutter Alley, but it's called Charter Alley today. The one on the right at the top is Berkeley, where I remember attending a Methodist Revival Fellowship meeting, the same as at Charter Alley. The one at the bottom on the left is Wooden St. Lawrence, I remember talking to an elderly man there, sort of white hair, you know, probably in his mid-70s. And he saying, you know, there'd be horses outside, there'd be, the chapel would be full, and people would be so eager to be converted and saved and respond to the gospel, climbing over the pews to get to the front when an appeal was made, and I thought, wow. And the one on the bottom at the right, that's at Oakley. That's the Oakley in Hampshire, of course. I believe there are about five places called Oakley. That's actually where I preached my first sermon as well. That was back in 65. So I met elderly people there and they, they, there was something about them, I think, that they had experienced in their youth 
The final embers of that revival I'll be telling you about in a few minutes. I think that's what happened. And, and, and the flame, it just caught my heart. Ruth 1, verse 16. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. And as I read those books, as I met those people, that was the sentiment in my heart. That's going to be the religion that I want to follow for the rest of my life. And I haven't lived up to that hope, but in God's mercy, I'm still seeking to do that. So I got certain models, really, role models, we call them, don't we? John Wesley, of course. I read a biography of John Wesley by a man called Vallamy. I don't know why I chose that one. It was perhaps the only one I knew. I got it as the uh, sixth form Latin prize. Well, you were able to choose a book. So I said, I'll have a biography of John Wesley. And I read it and I thought, what a life. And of course, the two at the bottom are Hugh Bourne and William Close, or Clues. Nobody quite knows how he pronounced himself. And they were regarded really as the founders of primitive Methodism. So I read their life stories, or I read their works, or I read about them, and I thought, yeah, that's, that's what I want to do. That's what I want to live like. So I wanted to live for the gospel. I would the precious time redeem and longer live for this alone, to spend and to be spent for them who have not yet my Saviour known. Fully on these my mission prove, and only breathe to breathe thy love. My talents, gifts and graces, Lord, into thy blessed hands receive. And let me live to preach thy word, and let me to thy glory live. My every sacred moment spend in publishing the sinner's friend. It's a hymn I love to choose to this day when I'm preaching. That's the old primitive Methodist chapel at Rotherwick. And I was planned to preach there in 1965. So there I am starting to preach. As you know, that wasn't the first time I preached. That was at Oakley, but this was a few weeks or months later. And then I acquired a Christian wife. Now this is an old primitive Methodist principle. It's an old biblical principle. If you want to follow God through your life, either you need to remain unmarried or you need to marry someone who shares your vision and your faith. And whatever I've done in the pastorates at Hadlow and Fly in the Albanian mission, I couldn't have done without the loyal support of Margaret at home today, of course, tonight, and still encouraging me in the research I do for writing these books and letting me go around preaching and so on. So I looked for and God granted me a Christian wife. And we've been together now since 19. 70. We weren't married in 1970, but we were married in 1973. But that's when we, we felt this is, this is the will of God, that we should be together. And that's our first home. You can see what we call it. We called it Malcop. What better name for a house. And that was in Borough Green in Kent. I, when I left Cambridge, the university, I came down to Kent. And I lived in Kent from 68 until 77. And that's the first house that we had. We only rented it. We, we weren't able to buy. Of course, it's quite expensive. So, there we are, Malcop. Those are the two churches. Hadlow at the top and Sly at the bottom. All of this because that revival movement that had touched my life, the last embers really, and the knowledge of it, had made me want to preach that gospel. Went to Kosovo in 1974, until I retired, and then in 2015 as well. That's our little Renault Fall that Margaret and I went to Kosovo in, uh, in 1974, shortly after we'd been married. And there I am giving a lecture about the Protestant movement amongst the Albanian people at the Grand <coughs> Hotel in, in Pristina, the capital of Kosovo. And... Uh, I think it's the only time I've been on telly in any country, but that's rather uh, nice to have that. Then into Albania, when it opened up, wanting to see the same gospel, the same power of the Holy Spirit, the same prayer, 
there in Albania and writing various books, of course, about Christianity. So why? Well, as I've told you, largely because of the reading and the people that I'd met. So I want to tell you about that movement. When I retired, 2011, I thought it's time to look into my roots. Perhaps you've done the same thing, because I think we are getting a bit wrinkly as the years go on. We often think we'd want to look back into our own roots. And the Bible says, look to the rock from which you were hewn and to the quarry from which you were digged. And I thought, how did Methodism come to my area, Northern Hampshire? I'm going to read about it. Put my feet up, you know, like you do when you're tired, in theory. Read about it. Well, then I discovered nobody would written about it. There was the odd reference in Joseph Ritson and here and there, but nobody would really written about it. So I thought, well, I'll write about it myself, or at least I'll go and find out about it myself. That's how I got into finding out these things. C.S. Lewis once said that people don't write the kind of book that he'd like to read, so he writes them himself. Well, in a very faint way, that was the same idea. So I'm going to tell you about this primitive Methodist mission to northern Hampshire. So as you know, it comes from Mount Cop. But in those far off days, 1807, of course, it was a um, very wild country. And that's where the Spirit of God fell in May 1807. And the movement spread from, well, it spread in a lot of different directions, it particularly went off in the direction of Hull. There were still three primitive Methodist churches functioning in East Yorkshire. But it also came in this direction, first of all, to Shrewsbury. And the society, as Methodists call their church members, the society in Shrewsbury sent an evangelist down to Wiltshire, a man called Samuel Heath, in 1824. So that's Shrewsbury, as you can see. It's not a picture of what it was like in 1824, but that's the town. So down to Wiltshire, and he was joined by John Ride. Now, John Ride had a very powerful ministry in a lot of places, and he got this nickname, if you like, uh, the Apostle of Berkshire, because he, he was in Berkshire and that area where he was sent from Wiltshire. He was there for quite a number of years. Eventually, he was put in charge of overseeing all the missionary activities throughout Britain. And then he went to Australia himself as a missionary amongst the settlers over in Australia. So he was, but he was a very significant figure. And they ministered at Brinkworth, that's the old primitive Methodist chapel, and in 1828 he went there. Now, Brinkworth was, first of all, it's a very long village, I don't know if you've ever driven through it, but it would take you a long time, even in a car, it's quite long. And it had this reputation of being a very dangerous place. You didn't go through Brinkworth alone, unless you were very brave or very foolish or simply didn't know what the place was like because it was so violent, there was so much crime, and I suppose robbery and muggings and that sort of thing. They had violent sports known as backsorting and uh, violent sports and crime, uh, drunkenness. It was an absolutely dreadful place. It had an awful reputation and so the primitive Methodists thought they need the gospel. So you've got uh, Samuel Heath went down there, John Rye joined, and one or two other people as well. And it became the centre of quite a powerful revival in that area. The story of that revival is told in a book called Victory in the Villages by a man called William Tonks, who was uh, a minister in Brinkworth. So that was in Wiltshire, and here you see a map, Brinkworth is number one, and when they started to spread into Berkshire and then later into Hampshire, they went down to the Bourne Valley, you can see Vernon Dean and that area down there, they went across to 
That's number three. They went down to Mitchell Dever. Number three is Great Shefford. But they went down to the Bourne Valley. They went across to Shefford, down to Mitchell Dever, and from Shefford they went across to Reading, and then down into Hampshire again in the Silchester area. So that was the geographical spread by which they came. And Mitchell Dever became the centre, really, for the revival to spread. Now, Thomas Russell and Richard Jukes were also sent down to that area to begin a Berkshire mission from Brinkworth. You see where the arrows went. Russell was imprisoned at Abingdon. The excuse that was given was that he was selling hymn books without a licence as a peddler. But really it was to shut him up as a preacher. And so he was sentenced to hard labour at Abingdon. The Society for Religious Freedom or some such title took on his case and, and he was released. But he experienced a lot of brutal physical persecution. One of the things about the Hampshire and Berkshire mission is that it experienced some of the most physically brutal persecution throughout the country. There wasn't only imprisonment, but people were stoned, other things were thrown out there, they were thrown into rivers and uh, all kinds of terrible, terrible things. When I say stoned, I don't mean to death, but you know, people pick up flints from the, from the road. And if you've ever been to Hampshire and seen the flinty stones, they're, they're quite sharp. So, Thomas Russell went down, and then something very remarkable happened. And whatever book you read, whether it's... Um, you know, Joseph Ritson or, or, or more or less any other history of primitive Methodism, it tells you about this event. John Ride, who you saw the Apostle of Berkshire, Thomas Russell, they were going to start from where they were, the Berkshire Mission. And one of them was going to be preaching at Lambourne, and one of them was going to be preaching at Ashbury, and they were both in Bishopstone. So they said, we'll walk together. So they walked over Rusley Down, you go up Nell Hill, and you go up Rusley Down, and you get down to this clump of trees you can see called Botley Cot. It was February 1830. It was snowy on the ground, slushy, wet sort of snow on the ground. This is the track, by the way, leading to Lambourne, where one of the two went. And they were talking about the Lord's work, and they were... You know, sharing their burden and uh, I think probably they stopped and prayed more than once but they got to this clump of trees Botley Cops and that's where the two ways parted one to Lambourne, one to Ashbury they said let's turn aside it into this copse and let's have one final round of prayer together and they knelt in the snow and they prayed and they wrestled with God but they prayed for some hours it wasn't just the Lord we're going to part now bless us thank you for our fellowship it was some hour pleading with God for this mission into Berkshire that was about to begin. And in the end, Thomas Russell got this assurance of faith. And he leapt up from his knees where they were praying. And he said those famous words, yonder country is ours and we shall have it. And with that assurance, they separated. And by September, they had 250 members. They made a point of not trying to gather people from other churches, but preaching to the unconverted. So they had 250 members by September, and that was just in February that they had that round of prayer. God really heard those prayers and really blessed them. And John Ride moved to Great Shefford in Berkshire. There you see Great Shefford today. And Shefford became a circuit. I don't know how Methodism works, but you have a central church and it has a circuit of other churches around it. In those days, they tended to make a village the centre. Nowadays, it tends to be a town. Uh, by March 1832, that's about two years later, isn't it? That circuit had 60 preaching places. I don't mean they had 60 chapels, because they were sometimes in barns or farmhouses or wherever. 60 preaching places. By June of the next year, they had 15 full-time preachers and nearly 1,300 members. 
No wonder Thomas Russell could look out over that sort of countryside and say, yonder country is ours and we shall have it. God had promised him that. So that went into Berkshire. But the Berkshire mission extended. April 1831, they said, we need to go and work in Hampshire. And that village, which you can just about see, it, it's not exactly a big place, and it's called Coombe. I think that's how you pronounce it. I have seen it spelled C-O-A-M as well as C-O-M-B. But anyway, it's a small village at the top of the Bourne Valley. You go over the hills in Peng Beacon and that, and, and then you're in the Bourne Valley. And that's where they first began to preach in Hampshire. Mainly, you see, amongst agricultural labourers, the Wesleyans had concentrated on the towns and the industrial heartlands where there were lots of people. But the Prims tried to concentrate more on places that hadn't been evangelised. So they went to Coombe, and then they went down the Bourne Valley. Here on the left, you're looking towards Lincoln Holt. And here you see an 1845 chapel built in 1845 at a place called Little Down. And that, that had a whole string of chapels in that valley. There's only one Wesleyan and a whole string of primitive Methodist chapels. One of them was up for sale recently when I was last there. And I uh, wish I had enough money to buy it and set up the preaching of the gospel. And over the door it still says, Prepare to meet thy God. And I thought, this is wonderful, that all these years later, even though the work has been abandoned, the message is still there. Prepare to meet thy God. That's one of the earliest chapels in the Bourne Valley. It was missioned by John Ride and others, and that chapel was opened in 1838 at St. Marybourne, the part of St. Marybourne known as Swampton. And then, as I say, they moved also, not only down the Bourne Valley, but also from Shefford down to Mitchell Dever. And that is the River Dever that you see there. It's near, near Winchester. And that was 1831, 1832, that kind of time that the planning was made and the preaching began. Now that's what it looked like. It had a population of 936 people. It's a small rural village. And it became the centre of a widespread revival movement. And I, I emphasise this because here we are in Hookgate. I don't know which churches you good people are all from. But we don't have to be in a big town for the Spirit of God to fall and make what happens here, or wherever it is, something that can spread far and wide. So Mitchell Dever became very much the centre. There was an Anglican who was converted and began preaching around in that area. Langford, his name was, Robert Langford, I think, and... Uh, he wanted to get something established, so he, he contacted the Prims and said, can you send someone here? And, and they negotiated and they visited, and uh, that's how they got invited to come through this converted Anglican who joined them. He became a primitive Methodist minister himself, and they set up the, the work here. So notice the date, 1831, 1832. I'm going to show you something else in a minute. Anyway, they had a camp meeting, one of these big open air meetings, 1834, just outside, up on the downs. Probably there were present at one time in the afternoon from 5,000 to 6,000 persons. Now this is a report written by Edward Bishop, who was one of the ministers present, not just hearsay. When we returned to the preaching stand, the vast concourse of people stood as if they were entranced. The preachers had extraordinary liberty, and the word was indeed with power. The people in prayer wrestled with God and prevailed, and the song of praise seemed to make the place a paradise. So uh, that was that was a wonderful meeting. As uh, one of the part of the report said, it was as if heaven and earth came together. Initially, about half of those people who turned up were 
opponents of the movement who wanted to persecute or cause trouble or cause disruption and, and, and so on. Somebody turned up with a, a wagon with, with a barrel, I don't know how many barrels, one or more of beer to try and get the people uh, drunk so that they would cause even more problem. But the Spirit of God fell and the people wrestled and the song of praise came to make the place like a paradise. What a marvellous meeting that must have been. But there's Edward Bishop, he was in prison too. And so was John Ride. They were imprisoned at Winchester because of their open air preaching. It was said that they were causing a disturbance and frightening everybody and, and uh, all this sort of thing. They had a policeman there who had been sort of put up to it really and, and, and said, oh, you know, it was a terrible thing and they had cudgels and so on. But when the case came to court, the magistrates threw it out because there were so many witnesses who said, it's not like that at all. This Thomas Ellery, the constable, it just wasn't like that at all. And Edward Bishop and John Rye were then released, but they had to go into prison while they were waiting for the trial until they were released. The phrase is, on their own recognizances. That um, means they had to pay up, I think, if... Uh, anything went wrong with the pressurising of them. Newnham, 1846, that was Bill. I preached there once. It's somebody's shed now, alas. Mid-1830s. <laughs> On the village green, they didn't have many hearers. Now, they didn't always have these glorious meetings with hundreds attending. They didn't get many people listening. But in the 1840s, it says, I love this phrase, a spirit of hearing was poured upon the people. Now that's what we want. In Hookgate, the loggerheads, a spirit of hearing to be poured out upon them. So by the time we get to the 1851 religious census, you know, the government said, we want to know who's going to what churches throughout the country, every denomination, Mormons, Church of England, Anglicans, Jews, Methodists, the whole lot. You've got to send in how many worshippers you've got on this one Sunday. It's the only time the government's ever done it. They had 22 in the morning and about 80 in the evening. Now, they would have had more in the evening because, of course, they were largely farm workers and had been working, looking after the animals and so on, more in the daytime. I didn't have 80 when I preached there. It's, it's sad to see the way things have gone down. Remember what I said about Mitchell Dever itself? There was continual opposition from Sir Thomas Bart, uh, Baring, sorry. Bart, of course, is baronet. He constantly blocked their attempts to acquire land or a building as a place of worship. His agent went the night before they were about to sign the contract, hand over the money, do whatever it was you did in those days, and said to the man selling to them, I'll give you more money. And they lost it like that. And it wasn't until 1867. And remember, I said, think about it. They went there first in 1831, 32. That's over. That's about 35 years. Meeting in homes, meeting in the open air, going to prison for doing it, seeing a revival spread, and one landlord blocking their own attempts in their home village. So just a reminder of Mitchell Dever. That's approaching the village today. And you can see, I think, again, as I would love to emphasize, God can do these things in small places. It, what you, you've got to pray that God will do it where you are, even if you are in a small place. Small rural village. There is another street. So they moved along to Reading. Now, I know Reading's not in Hampshire. I'm talking to you about Hampshire, but you'll see why, because they went down into Hampshire from Reading. 1835, we had over a thousand people attending the opening services when the mission started. They rented a chapel called Salem or Salem. I haven't been able to get an image of it, regrettably. It's probably been demolished long since. By October, they had about 70. They only started in April. They do it village evangelism. Look at this lovely phrase concerning Reading itself, 1838. The chapel was well attended. And the converting power rolled on and became so mighty that we were necessitated to hold many and at times long meetings. 
It would be great if somebody said to me, you know, David, you've been preaching at Hookgate for, I don't know how long it is, two or three years, whatever. What's it like then? Oh, praise God. The converting work is rolling on. Yeah, that's what I want to be able to say about wherever I preach. Not I want it all to happen through me, but whoever comes. So John Ryde in the Village Evangelism, 30, 1835. Her brother Woodward preached in the barn at Mortimer to a very large congregation. They had a camp meeting at Mortimer. Then at Silchester, the house being so excessively crowded... It was with difficulty I spoke to the people. They didn't get their chapel till 1839. That's why it says the house. Watch night service at Soak on Christmas Eve. That's about a mile from Silchester. Ten were enabled to believe in the great atonement and obtained pardon. I love that. The great atonement. The fact that Jesus died for all of our sins. What a great sacrifice he made when he gave his life a ransom for many. Ten were enabled to believe in the great atonement and obtained pardon. So you can see the work spreading down to Hampshire from the Reading Mission. There's a little chapel at Silchester. The one behind, the red brick one, is the one they use today. The chapel now is their sort of Sunday school hall. Why do you think God blessed them? Five o'clock on Sunday mornings, Methodists at Silchester met with the ones from West End and from Soak to hold prayer meetings. No wonder God blessed them. Charter Alley, you saw a picture about that. I got that picture a little bit earlier on. At that religious census, when they were still in a dwelling, they didn't get this chapel until 1852. They had 92 people in the afternoon and 137 in the evening. Actually, 137 people. They couldn't all have got in the house, and they must have overflowed out into the garden or wherever, mustn't they? So here's the national background now. It's not just Hampshire. 1829 up to 52, look at the way God was blessing all that time. I'll tell you about Isaac Septimus Nullis. He died young. A powerful evangelist while he was alive. 25th of February, 1855, Salvation Meeting at Silchester. Now, they'd have been in the chapel by then. You've just seen a photograph of it. Had a mighty time while preaching. That February in Silchester, about 20 people professed faith. Then you go on to 1855, April. Glory be to God, the work is moving all around Silchester. Tadley, Borghurst, Chatter Alley, Upper Wootton, and East Sherborne. I think East Sherborne is the old name for Sherborne St. John, by the way. So you can see that they're the moving all around. This is another minister. Prem, uh, camp meeting at Borghurst, when five souls were brought to the Saviour. The following day, camp meeting at Silchester, six professed faith. The following day, powerful prayer meeting, at which 15 or 20 came to faith. Now, people would come to prayer meetings seeking salvation those days. August, Silchester, nine professed faith, six new members received into society. Tadley, five professed faith. Charter Alley, a young man, got into gospel liberty. Young lady, converted. I got all this from Isaac Nullis's some writings, by the way. 1864, this is nine years later, at Charter Alley, not Charter Alley, as it's called today, there were several penitents, among whom was a woman of profligate habits and disreputable character. At Borghurst, two were saved, one of them nearly 70 years of age. Thursday, I attempted to close the meeting three or four times, but failed to do so. Till one in the morning, seven found peace. One of them, a man nearly 75 years of age. November, four more obtained pardon. The place seemed filled with the sweetest influence of the Holy Spirit. December, the chapel was crowded. Numbers could not gain admission. The following week, ten were saved. Two of them, very strong young men, very hard drinkers. Two old men. This work continued till over 70 were brought to Jesus. 1864, still from Isaac Nellis, every night, Meetings have been held in the chapel and the mightiest revival of religion ever seen by anyone now living in the villages 
in the village is now going on. Not fewer than 60 souls have found salvation during 18 days. The vilest of sinners and persecutors are being saved. The village is all a move. Men and women that were never prayed, scarcely in their lives, have been wrought on by God's Spirit in their houses and in the streets and have made their way to our little chapel in the greatest agony of soul to be prayed for. Do you see what I say? I think I probably experienced the final embers of that movement because that would have been perhaps the parents of the people that I met when I was in my teens and they told me what it had been like. Right, the three R's were one of their emphases, ruin, redemption and regeneration. We're ruined by sin, Christ died to redeem us and we can be born again, regenerated through faith in him. Prayer was at the heart of the movement. There was spontaneity coupled with planning. They were excitable meetings. Someone was preaching at Cloy, which is near Bangor on Dee, and he said, I had to stop for a while because people were shouting. Well, they can shout at football matches and Elvis Presley meetings and things like that. Why can't they shout when they're getting excited about Jesus Christ? It was an exciting movement. Emphasis on the scriptures. A call for conversion. Close fellowship. They were looked after what were called class meetings where they share their experience and pray and sing and worship together. And I told you about, in some cases, brutal physical opposition and even imprisonment. Now, Frederick Harper was a primitive Methodist minister who wrote this in 1932 when the movement was re-amalgamated, or most of it was anyway, with the Wesleyans and the United Methodists. I love to think of our church in the dawn of her glory. I love the volcanic fire of her heart, the thrill of song, the buoyant testimony of her saints. I love her because of her unquenchable ideals, the largeness of her hope, the untiring energies of her faith. Hebrews 11 verse 7. Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God, Consider the outcome of their life and imitate their faith. And whether you're Methodist, Baptist, Independent, whatever you are this evening, these people were still leaders in a work which God did. And I think we need to do that. We need to remember them. We need to consider the outcome of their life. And we need to imitate their faith.